1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse number 22, says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of our Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. I thought that was an interesting account to open with as we think of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul was the first king of Israel. After Israel was demanding a king, Saul was given to them of the tribe of Benjamin. And Saul already in the chapter before, uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul had already been presumptuous in offering a sacrifice without the priest, Samuel. And then again in chapter 15, he is given instructions to go to Amalek and to wipe out man, woman, and child to destroy every living creature there and Saul disobeyed God and Samuel's response was to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of the rams but we see that Saul would ask to be forgiven I'm sorry I'm sorry but it was too late for Saul he would be rejected from being king and David would be put in his place the rightful king of Israel this morning we're going to talk about the lesson that you see in front of you, sorry, not sorry. Now, this lesson is, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's a song. I've never actually heard the song. I'll admit to you right now, I've never heard the song, the pop song, because I just don't listen to that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not missing much. Uh, but it is a song. Um, and, and so uh, uh, a famous singer has used that song. But we see this, this, this phrase being used a lot. You would see when somebody's trying to be sarcastic, they'll say, sorry, not sorry. When they're trying to give an insincere apology for not being uh, apologetic in the first place, they would say, sorry, not sorry. Do you see what they're doing? So basically they're saying, yeah, I don't care what you think. I'm going to do what I want to, and, and that's that, right? That's essentially, basically the premise of it. But I think we can learn some lessons from this. Because I think we can look at a couple of different types of sorrow in the Bible, and I think we can learn some things, okay? So this is kind of the, the, the avenue or the aim. <clears throat> this is the way that we're going to proceed through this. And I think I'm going to split it down the middle, and I think we'll do two lessons, and it shouldn't take any longer than two weeks to do it. If you will, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 7, and verse 10. You'll see what, uh, uh, what we're going to talk about. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, and this is not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. Now Paul says there are at least two different kinds of sorrow. Right? We've talked about this a lot. We, we talk about these kind of things a lot in a lot of the, uh, the Bible studies scenarios and discussions we have. We talk about these kind of things quite a bit. Let me give you two scenarios. All right, so a guy, uh, a guy goes and, and robs a bank, and in the process of robbing the bank, he shoots a security guard, and he is convicting, uh, convicted of not only armed robbery but felony murder, and he is sentenced to the electric chair in Florida, and he sits on death row for about 15 years, and then finally he is put to death. Now, during his time on death row, the guy's really, really sorry that he's there. Well, yeah, I would imagine he is sorry he's there. There's no actual remorse. He's sorry that he's in the situation in the first place. He wishes he could get out of the situation. He, he makes the appeals to spare his life, but he is not actually sorry enough to do anything about the actual crime he's committed. Now that's worldly sorrow. I'm sorry that I got caught. Paul said worldly sorrow works death. It's completely worthless, meaningless. But he says there is a godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation. Now let's give another scenario. Let's say that uh, the same individual, he, he was uh, robbing a bank and he committed murder while robbing a bank. And he gets the electric chair and he's sitting on death row for 15 years. And during this time, somebody cared enough to go to this prison and to offer to study the Bible with inmates. And this inmate says, you know what, I want to hear what you have to say. 
And upon hearing the truth of the gospel, this man's heart was pricked and he wanted to know what was required of him. And he would probably even ask the question, can I, even I, can I be saved after all the terrible things that I've done? And of course the answer is yes. By obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, every sin can be remitted. But you may still have to pay the penalty for your crimes. And this man would obey the gospel and he would genuinely be sorry. And this man could face the electric chair with hope, couldn't he? Two different kinds of sorrow. Worldly sorrow. That is, I'm sorry I got caught. And a godly sorrow, I am genuinely sorry for what I've done. There's a big difference between those two also. Sometimes it's hard for us to see. You and I, we're imperfect. That, 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 this goes exactly with what we were talking about in Bible study when I said that I could not be a just, objective judge. Me, personally, I know I'm deficient. There's no way I could do it. There's no way I could do it. And it may not necessarily be in the way that you think. Rather than being too harsh, I think I would be too lenient. I think that if somebody came in, in tears and bawling, they put on a really good show, I'm inclined to, to believe them. They may be lying. And I would be unjust if I passed a sentence that wasn't just for their crimes. So I'm glad I'm not in that scenario. I'm really glad I'm not. And I'm thankful that God is ultimately the just judge because he genuinely really knows whether we're sincere or not. But I want to establish something. And that is sorrow in and of itself is not repentance. Now we've talked a lot about, we've done a lot of studies on repentance. <clears throat> Me having been a person who has repented and you also being people that have repented at one time, we've probably spent time, I know personally I have spent a lot of time studying every aspect of repentance. I, I understand it thoroughly and I know exactly what it is. And repentance is literally a change in mind or a change in will. I'll give you an example. If you want to go back and you can thumb in your Bibles if you want to or just allow me to walk you through it. In Jonah chapter 3. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, you have that God tells Jonah in chapter 1 to go to Tarshish and to preach to them. And Jonah, or to Nineveh, excuse me, and he runs to Tarshish, right? And he, he gets on the boat and he jumps in the water because of the, the storm and he's swallowed by the great sea beast, right? And the sea beast vomits him up onto the shore and finally Jonah realizes he can't, he can't run from God so he goes on into Nineveh. And this is such a magnificent, huge city. That it's essentially, uh, he walks into it a day's journey. So he's only about a third of the way into it. And he, he begins to preach. Repent. God's going to destroy this nation or this city in 40 days. And if you go to Jonah 3 and you look at verses 5 through 10, you'll see that they did something. They believed what Jonah said about God destroying this nation. And you know what they did? The king said, let every man turn from his evil ways and the violence of his hands. And in verse 10 it says, And God saw their works. They repented, didn't they? How do you know they repented? They completely changed. They not only changed their mind about what they were doing, they completely changed their actions. It was a complete reformation of life. Now, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says that they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, whatever they did, Jesus says is repentance. So when an inspired man makes application of a word or phrase to an Old Testament account, account, what should we do? Pay attention, right? Learn from it. So when we talk about what they did in Nineveh, that was repentance. They changed their mind after hearing the message. They changed their minds and they completely reformed their life. Was it temporary? Actually, yes. But they still changed, didn't they? Because that city would be destroyed not far down the road. But when we're talking about repentance, repentance is literally... I've changed my mind. I was stealing, I was lying, I was cheating, committing fornication, whatever. I was doing whatever I wanted to, and then I realized, you know what, this is wrong. This is wrong. I am not only hurting others, I am offending God. I've got to stop. I've changed my mind, and now I will no longer steal or cheat or lie or commit fornication, right? I've changed my mind. Somebody once said that repentance is a highly visible attitude. They're right. If you've really changed, you don't have to tell people you've changed, do you? Because everybody would see it. Now, repentance is not sorrow. If repentance is literally a change in will, then repentance is not literally sorrow. Is sorrow involved? Certainly. But repentance is not sorrow, and sorrow 
is not repentance. There is only a certain kind of sorrow that actually is beneficial. And that's kind of what we were talking about earlier, right? Godly sorrow, worldly sorrow. Is worldly sorrow... Do you know that uh, when I worked in the jail or the prison, do you know that a lot of times when inmates go to, br to prison or to jail, they find religion in prison or jail, and as soon as they leave, they leave it right there with them. They leave it in the, pr in the cell, and they walk on out and do their thing again. Not all the time, but a lot of times. That's an example of worldly sorrow, right? Well, I'm really sorry I got caught. You know what? I'm going to try to straighten up a little bit and, and give, it a, you know, give it a decent effort. That's just not enough, right? That's not a genuine change. Anybody in here that is genuinely changed, you understand what that is. That is, you know what? I hate what I did. I absolutely hate it, and I will never do it again. Right? That's a, that's a big change. All right. When we're talking about sorrow, as this lesson points out, sorry, not sorry. As we're talking about sorrow, we need to understand that folks could die lost in sorrow. I could be sorry and die lost. I could be sorry that I've got caught. I could be sorry that I've done wrong. I could genuinely be sorry that I've offended God. And I could die in that state and I'm lost. I haven't done anything about that yet, have I? I could be sorry, but that isn't repentance. And repentance leads to reformation of life. And that's only a step in the process of salvation. That isn't salvation in and of itself. I'm sorry. Well, what are you going to do about it? Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, please. Mark chapter 6. I want to give you an example of this. Or a couple of examples, but we'll start here. Folks can die lost in sorrow, right? Sorrow in and of itself isn't enough. Sorrow is, you could say, an initial stage, right? That's the first part of it. And it's got to lead you somewhere. Sorrow must cause a change in our will. A change in our mind that leads to an amended or reformed life. In Mark 6, beginning in verse number 22, excuse me, verse 21, we're going to read of the account of old Herod. <clears throat> now, if you know, Herod, um, Herod married his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. Herodias married Philip, and then Herodias divorced Philip and married Herod. Right? So you have that uh, Herod married his brother Philip's wife. That's what John tells him, which is why John loses his head. Right? So that's a little background. But in Mark 6, 21, it says, And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou will, and I will give it to thee. Now, what kind of guy is Herod, number one, to be looking at his his stepdaughter in such a way. He's a creep. And he swear unto her, unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee, even unto half of my kingdom. All right? Verse 24. And she went forth and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John. Now, why do you reckon Herodias didn't like John? Well, because John stood to, told him right to their face that they were wrong. Then she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying... I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. <coughs> Excuse me. And the king was exceeding sorry. Let me read that for you again. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison. Now, Brother Woods was asked about this in one of his questions and answers. And it was about violating oaths. Is it okay if I made, if I made a promise when I was, let's say, when, if I made a promise when I was in sin, and that promise was something that was sinful in and of itself, is it okay to break that promise? And of course, everybody gets hung up. Oh, if you make an oath, you got to, do you really think God, oh, I, I promise if you do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to kill your whole family if you do this. Is it okay to break that promise? I'm going to go ahead and tell you, yes. Don't kill somebody's whole family because you told somebody you would. Herod was wrong. Herod should have said, look, I will not do this. I'm sorry I was wrong in the first place. Folks, I apologize. I promised her this, but I'm not going to do this. He's a good man. There's no way I'm doing it. 
That would have been right. But he says, for his own sake, he did it. But getting back to the point, it says that Herod was sorry, but he did it anyway. Sorry, not sorry. Well, I'm kind of sorry, but I'm not sorry enough to actually change my mind. I'm going to behead John, who everybody, I mean, everything we read of John is he was, he was a very good man. He was, uh, he was a very humble man. He had a, a, a humble means. He wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't living in any flashy way whatsoever, was he? He simply told the truth. Jesus said that among those born of women, there's not greater than John the Baptist. But I'm going to kill him because my stepdaughter said that she wants his head on a charger. What does that tell you about the bloodthirsty the bloodlust that these kind of folks have. You said I couldn't marry him. I'm going to get you. He was exceeding sorry. It says he was. He just wasn't sorry enough, was he? Didn't lead to anything. This word, paralupos, you've got the, the strong concordance listing there. Grieved all around. That is intensely sad. It says it means very or exceeding sorrowful. What does that mean? It's what it, it's, it's what it says. He was really sorry. I'm going to give you a couple other usages here. What you see is this word does mean sorry, but it doesn't necessarily bring about the idea of remorse. What is remorse? Well, remorse is I am sorry for something that I've done. Right? It is I'm genuinely, man, I'm really ashamed of this. I, I want to try to make things right. Remorse, now we're getting closer towards godly repentance or godly sorrow there. In Matthew 26, 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. This is Jesus in the garden. There's no remorse involved, is there? Because Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, but he was very sorry. There was a lot of sorrow in his heart. Luke 18, beginning in verse 23, and excuse me, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, the rich young ruler. Well, he was pretty sorry, but there wasn't any remorse involved. He wasn't sorry enough to actually sell all that he had and give it to the poor like Jesus said. He was sorry because Jesus knew that the one thing he lacked was, your goods are going to keep you out of heaven. Man, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'm going to go count my money now. This was a sorrow. It says it was. But this sorrow did not lead to anything beneficial. Let's turn to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 2. Excuse me, beginning in verse 3. Judas. Judas is an interesting character. Now, if you go to Matthew 10, you can see that Judas is listed among Jesus' apostles. Question, was Judas an apostle? Yes. Well, if he was an apostle, then he had miraculous activity going on. Is that true? Yes. But he also fell from that position. Is that true? Yes. So far we've got a lot of affirmations that you and I don't have a problem with because of the actual Bible teaching on this. But a lot of our denominational friends have a problem with this. A lot of our denominational friends believe that um, the miraculous reception of the Holy Spirit in these days uh, was, was proof that you were in a safe state. And if you're in a safe state, then you can never fall from that state. Well, Judas... A, had miraculous activity, and B, fell from that position. So you've got problems with your view, right? It's not a biblical view. We understand that uh, even apostles did make mistakes, and even apostles who were inspired in their teaching and their preaching, they could find themselves in big trouble if they weren't careful, Judas being one of those. Mm -hmm. Now, what did Judas do? <clears throat> so if you remember, Judas went to these chief priests, these Jews, and says, what will you give me if I betray him? So they promised him the old 30 pieces of silver, right? Penance. But Judas was, Judas was a thief, right? We read that in John 6. We read that, that Judas was a thief. He had the bag that they, they would uh, have their money, their purse, that they would have their money, and they would go buy things. Then he would take out of the bag. Everybody knew Judas was greedy. So Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So we know the story is when Judas leads him to Jesus uh, on that day that he betrays him with a kiss, right? And they come and they take hold of him. <clears throat> verse, chapter 27 and verse 3 of Matthew says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned. Now, 
Judah sticks around to see what's going on. And they take him and they bring him forth and they're going to crucify him. And all of a sudden Judas is like, oh man, wait a minute. What, what have I done? And Judas, which betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. Saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou that to it. Now let me ask you a question. If repentance is a changed mind and a fruit of repentance is reformed life or trying to undo the damage you've done, would you say that at least one aspect Judas did really repent? I think he did. It says that he repented himself. Number one, that's the same word we'll look at in various other texts. He acknowledged the fact that he sinned. And he, he returns the money that was given him for this betrayal. Now that doesn't complete the process. We know that for a fact. But at least in this aspect, when Judah saw this, he was really sorry. What have I done? But look at verse 5. This explains further. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So instead of busting through the crowd and falling at the feet of Jesus and saying, Lord, I am so sorry. Forgive me, please. His sorrow led to suicide. It's terrible, isn't it? Was he really sorry? He must have been sorry. He was so sorry that he, he hanged himself. I mean, you've got to be in a really bad state of mind to do this. What would have been proper fruits of repentance? For him to cast the money down for betrayal, him to go to Jesus and acknowledge his sin. Had he done that, everything would have been okay. But he didn't do it, did he? He threw the money down and his sorrow drove him to suicide. It's not the same thing, right? That's a big difference. But again, it does say that he was sorry. Now in Matthew 21 and verse 28, Jesus says, A certain man had two sons. And he would say to the younger, Go today and work in my vineyard. And he says, I will not. But later he repented and went. To repent is to change your mind, right? We talked about that. That's exactly what it means. That is the literal definition. Changed actions come from repentance, but changed actions are a fruit, a demonstration of a changed mind. Literally, repentance is a changed mind. In Acts 2 and verse 38, <clears throat> it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Question, do you think that those Jews had to go and undo every sin they had committed up to that point? Yes or no? You could nod if you think so, or shake your head if you're like, no, they obviously didn't. No, sir, they did not. They didn't have to go and undo everything they'd done. They didn't have to go pay restitution for anything that they've stolen yet. They didn't have to go do any of these things. They were to change their mind, which can happen instantly, and obey the gospel, recognizing that whatever sins I've done, I'll not participate in them again. Right? That's literally changing their mind. That's what they did. They changed their mind. We're going to look at, as we get further next week, we're going to look at, uh, at Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Do you know that when Zacchaeus saw Jesus and then takes him into his house and he hears just a little bit of a message from Jesus, do you know what Zacchaeus does? He takes it upon himself to say, Lord. Now, Zacchaeus was this tax collector and he was very, he was very wealthy. He said, if I have taken anything by fraud, I'll restore it fourfold. And I'll give half my money to the poor to try to undo any harm I've done. Now, that's a magnificent thing, isn't it? He genuinely changed his mind. But when we're talking about the concept of repentance, in Acts 17.30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That means that repentance is possible right now, right here, wherever you are. What if you're in prison and you can't undo the harm? You can still repent. What if you're, uh, you're, you're laid up in a car accident and you can't bring anybody back from the people you've killed drinking and driving? Can you still repent? Yes. Restitution and repentance are not the same. Repentance is a changed mind. Restitution comes from that. Right? Reformation of life. Trying to undo the damage we've done. Trying to right the wrongs. Those are noble, worthy causes. But don't get that confused with the act itself. The act of repentance is an immediate, I've changed my mind. I will not go back. And then whatever comes, I will try to undo from henceforth like Zacchaeus said. That's the same thing that the, that the uh, prodigal son said in Luke 15. He came to himself. And what does he do? He now sets forth the plan. I will go to my father and I will tell him I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son, but make me a hired servant. 
He says, I've, I realize I was wrong. Now here's my plan to make it right. But when he came to himself, he repented, didn't he? He, he realized, I'm wrong. I've got to change. And he changed his mind and then his life changed, right? So while being closely related, repentance and the fruits of repentance, they aren't exactly the same. I will tell you this, that you can't really genuinely repent without bearing fruit. Won't happen. You know what? I used to steal and do all this stuff. I'm, re I'm really sorry. I've really changed my mind, but I'm going to keep stealing. Nope. You haven't changed anything, have you? If you really changed, you'll hate what you did. You'll despise it. You'll never do it again. And not only that, you'll do whatever you can to try to make things right where possible. Mm -hmm. That's restitution. That's the concept of a fruit of repentance. When the, when the Pharisees came to John's baptism in Matthew 3, isn't that what he demanded of them? Do you know that there are people out there in, this, in the Lord's church who will say that, you know what, if somebody wants to obey the gospel, we've got to dunk them in water. We don't have to say a word to them. What? John demanded fruits of repentance from the Pharisees. Is that not a valid principle? I'm not, I'm not saying we have to go into the life story here, but if, if we have somebody that walks in this door and says, hey guys, I want to be baptized, somebody dunk me in water real quick, we're going to say, no, no, let's sit down and talk first. Because they need to understand who Jesus is. They need to understand what he did. They need to understand the, the implications of, of belief, of uh, what repentance really means. They need to understand about uh, being baptized into Christ. Let me ask you this. What if this person comes in and he's been married 27 times and we don't, we don't even mention anything about repentance or, hey, man, just make sure that everything's as it ought to be. You know, you can't change your mind about something yet keep on doing it. I've heard brethren say the same thing about Matthew 19, 9. Whosoever uh, putteth away his wife, except to be for fornication, and marrieth another, committeth adultery. They would say, oh, that's a one-time act. You could continue in that relationship, just repent of the marriage itself. What? What are you even talking about? Committeth means you keep on committing. You keep on committing adultery as long as you're in this relationship. How do you repent of an adulterous marriage? You get out of it. You think, you think we're going to baptize somebody if they're living in an adulterous marriage? What are you doing besides giving them a bath? You're not doing anything. God will not forgive a person who doesn't repent. Have I missed something? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Last time I checked, repentance goes toward remission of sins just like baptism. And if you haven't really repented, you haven't been forgiven. So when we're talking about repentance, we're talking about I will genuinely change my mind. Now again, we understand that. Again, it, I, I've changed my mind. Repentance is something that is an acknowledgement of, of wrong. It is a change in, in will, a change in mind. And then we set our mind to do right. And again, I, I, I repeat this. That doesn't mean that in order to be forgiven of your sin to obey the gospel, you've got to go back and undo every sin you've ever done before you can be baptized. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying that they, they do need to understand the concept of repenting and turning away from sin. Then, just like the prodigal, we can make a plan. You know what? I'm going to try to write this stuff as I go along. Is that okay? Sure. So as we said in Judas's case, he returned the money paid to him for the betrayal. That is absolutely a fruit of that of repentance for that specific act. However, he had an offended party that he did make no effort to reconcile with. This sorrow, however, did not cause him to return to him who was betrayed, nor did it cause reformation of life. Suicide isn't reformation of life, is it? I'm sure he was sorry. You'd have to be to do that. But it did not motivate proper actions. This is what we're talking about. Godly sorrow motivates proper actions. Worldly sorrow motivates everything else. One more example, and we'll close out. In Hebrews chapter 12, we have an example of Esau. When we, studied, we, when we were studying Genesis, we realized just how despicable this really was. We're like, what, is it, what does it matter? Sell your birthright. That's like these guys that, in these, you know, these movies that sell their soul to sell. Well, I'm not using it right now. Isn't that what the guy on Old Brother where Art Thou said? Well, I wasn't using it, so I sold my soul to the devil to play a good guitar. But, you know, we, we talk about it that way, but when we're talking about Esau... To give your birthright under the patriarchal system was to give up the priesthood. It was to give up that position. It was to give up that interceder or that intercessory position between you and your family and God. 
It was to give up far more than just, oh, I'm not using my birthright. Who cares? And he did it because he was hungry. He did it for food. And that just emphasizes the carnal nature of Esau and how we've got to be really careful not to sacrifice spiritual things for carnal appetites. The Hebrews writer would say, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. Listen to how this Hebrews writer talks about Esau. He was a profane person. Why was he profane? He sold his birthright for one morsel of meat. And it says, For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Do you remember when he would go to his father and his father told him what had happened or he realized what, what, what had happened and he, he was very sorrowful. Too late now, he saw. Can we learn anything from this? We can learn to be very careful with our words and choices because some things you can't take back. John couldn't, or excuse me, Herod couldn't take it back after he removed the head of John the baptizer. Judas couldn't take it back once he hung himself. We can't take it back if we do things or say things that would hurt our influence even though we may seek it carefully with tears. We've got to be careful. I'm going to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here this morning that have never obeyed the gospel? You must hear the word of God, believe it, repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith in Christ, be baptized for the remission of sins, and live faithfully. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you're not faithful, repent. Come back to the Lord, acknowledge your sin, He'll forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. 1 John 5, 16. We're going to sing this invitation song as we do. If any have need, please come now as we stand and sing.